Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham Show. Today, we are going to talk about going from flustered to flourishing. And what does that mean? Well, whether you have had anxiety in your lifetime or you know someone who has, there are certain styles of anxiety that people have, and there are certain um, strategies, I'll say, I love that word, strategy, strategies that you can practice in the moment and apply to your daily life to avoid spiraling out of control or damaging relationships or hurting other people when your anxiety is building and you're experiencing those not so great emotional feelings. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Amber Trubel on to the Robin Graham Show. Amber, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and, and dig in and hopefully share some strategies and tactics with your audience that they could use today, like implement immediately when they need them. Yeah, it's fabulous. So we were talking just briefly before we started recording that, and, and listeners, you all know this, if you've been around for any length of time that I published my book last year, You, Me, and Anxiety. And with that being said, I was telling Amber that this weekend, my husband and I were walking our dogs and we see this little girl ride her bike into the drive, uh, into the street from the driveway and the mom freaked out and she was actually yelling at the child. And I said to my husband, oh my gosh, I wish I knew then what I know now, because I knew exactly what her brain was doing. She was panicked that something could happen to her child. And she, you know, that anxiety, that fear, that, that immediate overwhelm resulted in her basically screaming at her child in a negative way that probably intimidated the child versus helping the child to understand the consequences versus now she felt shame for having mm -hmm. done that. And I was raised that way because my father had severe anxiety and everything was always reactionary. And then I remember doing that to my kids and I said, oh my gosh, I wish I'd known then what I know now. So Obviously, I have done so much work to get better, but I'm excited to have this conversation with Amber today because she is truly an expert and she's written a book on the topic. And I think you're going to be able to see so much more of, oh, shoot, this is what's happening to me. And now this yeah. is how I can navigate it in the moment. So I'm going to stop talking, Amber, and <laughs> let you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today to write this book. Yeah, definitely. So again, my name is Amber Trueblood. I am a licensed therapist. I'm a mom to four boys. Right now they are 10, 12, 14, and 15 years old. And I always have to pause after I say that because people are like, wait, did you say four? And it, they're all boys, like, because it doesn't seem possible. Um, where I live in Southern California, it's not super common. So yes, that's that's the truth. Uh, I love writing. Um, I came into this world of of coaching moms and helping them with overwhelm and anxiety and writing books out of a deep drive to to serve in a way that was fun for me felt like it was an area that I could make a real impact and that I could help many instead of the one-on-one -on -one therapy model just didn't it wasn't a good fit for me you know it didn't speak to me it didn't feel good and I had four little kids at home at the time. So just the logistics and the finances of getting childcare just to go see one patient at a time, it didn't make sense to me. And my impatient nature and my anxiety style, which is dynamo, and we'll go into those in a minute, is very achievement oriented. And so it just was too slow for me. It was too little and it was taking too long to help the amount of people I really wanted to help that I felt driven to help. So that's where I am now. And it's been so incredibly fun. And I have my second book coming out. And like Robin said, it's all about really providing practical strategies that people can use both in the moment when you need them, depending on if you have like 30 seconds, if you have 10 minutes, what, you know, how much time do you have right now to kind of reduce the amount of stimulation in your central nervous system so that you can calm yourself physiologically. And sometimes that takes a hack where we go around our mindset <laughs> to get there because, you know, sometimes we don't have the time to sit and Zen out and meditate and write in our gratitude journal and all of these things, which are lovely practices. But if you have 10 minutes, <laughs> sometimes that's just not feasible, right? So what are the strategies you can use in the moment? And then what are the 
preventative strategies that you can start to implement every day in your life when you have time, when it's a good fit for you. So I love to kind of collect and create strategies. And then a lot of my work is all about helping you understand like, what's your motivational style? What's, what's your super sense? Like what visceral sense are you most attuned to? Okay. We can use that to match you better with your strategies. You know, what's your anxiety style, meaning what really drives you? Like what drives you both in a, in a way that maybe isn't serving you. And that's when it looks like anxiety. And then how is it also your flourish type? So it's kind of two sides of the same coin. So it's also having that anxiety style causes you to develop certain super like superhero traits, so to speak, you know, you're attuned to different things in a different way than somebody with a different anxiety style. So where can we celebrate those? Like, where is that amazing? Let's acknowledge and celebrate that not everybody can do that. Not everybody is super tuned into the present moment like you, right? Or Uh super tuned into the needs of others like you, or super focused on planning and organizing and can collect all of that stuff in their head and they notice every detail, right? So what skills and abilities do you have that maybe other people don't have? Let's celebrate those. And maybe within all of this, we can elicit a little bit more compassion, not only for other people in our life who maybe aren't skilled in those ways, but maybe we can elicit some more compassion for ourselves because I really firmly believe when we spend a lot of time in self-judgment and, and right. And shame and, you know, just frankly being unkind to ourselves, it's just a waste of our time. Right. Mm -hmm, (laughs) And mm -hmm. in this day and age with all of the distractions and all the responsibilities, I don't want you to waste your limited time and energy on beating yourself up. It's just, I get the propensity to do that. Like this woman that you mentioned yelling at her child, what did she feel like later on in that day? How much did she beat herself up then for that instead of, you know, noticing, okay, wow, that was my reaction. All right. I see where that came from. I know that I'm a lover anxiety style. We'll go, we'll go into details. I'll explain these, but, and man, my relationship with, with my kids and the people in my life are everything to me in a way that's amplified more than your average person who cares about, you know, the people in their life as we all do as humans. So, you know, understanding a little bit about her specific anxiety style and what maybe contributed to that can hopefully elicit some self-kindness. And then she will also have the tools to say, okay, how can I help myself through this now, knowing that that's, that's something that is, is a, is a trigger for me, you know, not Mm -hmm. that it wouldn't be for everybody, but like you saw, it was a super trigger. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all experience those, but in different ways. And I love that you brought the, the self-judgment and shame into this. Cause as you were talking, that was what kept coming to my mind was the shame that people live with when you suffer from anxiety and, Mm -hmm. you know, suffer is kind of a, I don't, I I don't know that that's the right word, but when you day in, day out, feel like you're not quote unquote normal, because I don't think we really have a true definition of normal anymore. Um, Those feelings do build and we do beat ourselves up. So, all right, well, I'm not going to talk anymore because I just want you to dive into (laughs) these anxiety styles and then what those simple strategies are to navigate them in the moment. Excellent. Okay, great. So we have five. So we have the lover, the fighter, the executive, the visionary and the dynamo. And these are based loosely on, if you remember back to like psych 101, if you ever took that um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, four of them are directly related to those needs. So these are kind of very fundamental needs we have as humans. And what happens maybe when they are particularly triggered during our childhood or not met or, you know, and everybody's different, right? So you might have siblings that had the same crazy childhood or the same you know, military life where you were moving from town to town to town. And everybody responds differently to that, right? It might affect one sibling more deeply or more profoundly than another sibling. And that's okay. That's, we're all human. So it doesn't mean that if you had that type of childhood, you for sure are going to end up with this particular anxiety style because we come to the planet with, with our own personalities and our own preferences. And anybody that has 
more than one child sees that right away. I saw that I have four boys. So, and they're all very close in age. They were all raised with the same parents. They have the same genetics. We had the same environment and they're all super different, Mm -hmm. right? So there's nothing, you know, everybody's your own person. And so I always like to say that, you know, you're the best judge of your own self-care and what's going to work for you. And often, you know, more than you give yourself credit for. So tuning into that. And as I share these strategies, when you find yourself kind of smiling and nodding knowingly, right. Or uh, laughing, that's when you have to tune in. That's the strategy that you already know on some gut level is likely to work for you. And it could be that you used to do it in the past and it was super helpful. And then life got busy or you went on vacation and you got out of the practice of it and you stopped. That happens all the time. It happens to me and I write books about this. So, you know, being kind to yourself is the first step. And then tuning in. Oh yeah. When she said this, that really resonated. Okay, great. That's the one thing I want you to take away from this that can always come back, listen to this later again, and then add a second strategy add a third, right? So you want to do it in a piecemeal kind of way, because I want this to be a long-term help for you. Not like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. I had a great weekend. And then Monday you go right back into your status quo because that's the habit and that's the routine. And I get it, but I would love for you to, you know, as, as you listen to this, take that one thing that resonated most and that's what you implement. Okay. Which one would you like me to start with? I'll let you pick. Okay. Just list the five again. Okay. Lover, fighter, executive, visionary, dynamo. Okay. Let's start with dynamo. Okay. All right. So I'm a dynamo. So I will say I in all of these and you know, you're not a hundred percent one, right? So you might really resonate with two of these almost equally, right? You might have one primary and one secondary. So, you know, listen to all of them. You also might say, oh gosh, that is not me, but that's totally my husband or that that's totally my eldest daughter, or that's my mother-in-law, holy mackerel. And so I'd love you to really tune into each of these because you'll get insights, hopefully that's the intention, into the other people in your life. And just maybe that will help you feel a little bit more connected to them, feel a little bit more compassionate and understand maybe how to get through to them, how to connect more readily. So in the book, I have a whole chapter on you know, kind of the obstacles and the opportunities for connection with each combination, right? So if you're a lover and your husband's a dynamo, how do you, you know, how, what words can you use, right? How can you frame things so that they actually hear you, you know, it actually gets through. Um, Okay. So the dynamo is somebody who is very, very connected with and driven by a sense of achievement, a sense of acknowledgement. Um, they are doers. They like to get things done, right? So I would say you you might know you're a dynamo if you add something to your to-do list. First of all, of course you have a to-do list. Second of all, you add something to your to-do list that you've already done just, just so that you off. can feel that Exactly. Just so that you can feel that satisfaction and that little adrenaline rush, that little dopamine high from checking it off. And, Mm -hmm. but you really truly feed off of that sense of acknowledgement, appreciation and achievement, not only from within, but from without, right. From Uh others. And Uh so in some ways in life, this has super duper served you. Right. And in other ways, maybe it's hindering you. So really acknowledging and celebrating those two, you know, where it's serving you and then noticing where is maybe this not serving me so much and what can I do then to release that and move, move through it into a little bit more healthy environment. So one of the things that I say about dynamos is that, you know, kind of the life lesson is how do you truly feel enough? You feel valued as a human regardless of your accomplishments. You're always going to be somebody who accomplishes because it's fun because you enjoy it. And I don't want to take that away from you. And I don't want anybody to take that away from me because it brings me joy. However, I also want to know deeply in my soul, in my heart, that I'm enough already, already. 
without doing the next thing, without writing the next book, right? And getting there is like a life lesson, right? This is not something I'm going to accomplish in the next week or two, right? It's a process. It's being aware of it. And there are skills and tools and things that I do on a daily basis and on a weekly basis to help myself learn that lesson and bring joy into the moment. So dynamos are also more in their heads than in their hearts or their guts. So that's something that I personally work on a lot, right? Okay, I'm always up here. I'm thinking, I'm planning, I'm deciding, I'm in the future and I'm in my head. So I realize that's not always serving me. It doesn't always serve my relationships, my connection with other people in my life, my ability to find joy in the present moment. So what can I do then to connect more with my gut, connect more with my intuition, connect more in this moment? Okay, we are right here recording this podcast. How cool is this? You're in Philly. I'm in San Diego. Like my husband took the kids to school. It's quiet. I have this lovely cup of hot coffee right here. Like, whoo, okay. That just brought me out of my head and out of the future. What am I going to say next? Okay, well, which one am I going to talk about? What examples am I going to use? And instead honing in on this moment in time and being really connected. And that has tremendous value, right? Because listeners, people we want to impact, they know if you're not paying attention, you're just blah, blah, blah. You're saying the same thing you say on all the last 50 podcasts and you're not even present. You're not even really connected. So that's something that I'm always very conscious of because it's not necessarily my default mode. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It makes total sense to me because this is me. This is you. <laughs> <laughs> I am like, oh my goodness. She's speaking to the choir here. So yeah, I I mean, this is totally me. So I, it makes 100% sense to me. And even in social settings, it, you know, in my mastermind and social settings, when I'm coaching clients, like I have to really focus on that can wait, that can wait. This yeah. is now and right. be in that moment. So I can see how, you know, when we're in that, it, it makes a lot of sense that when we're in that moment of, well, I've got this list that I need to check off by the end of the day or yeah. by the end of the week. <laughs> and we're so focused on that. And then when interruptions come, we, that anxiety rises and right. we almost panic or step into a place of fear that I'm not going to get this done. And then what's going to happen. Right. Right. And nothing's going to happen. Nothing. (laughs) Nobody cares. Nobody else cares if you finished your list. Exactly. And this is something I've had to work really hard on. And so, yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, Beautiful. So, And I do want to say for each of these in the book and anybody who pre-orders the book, I have all of these bonuses. So you can go to my website and put in your, you know, oh, I'm this style. And so I created a special guided meditations for each style, special mantra meditations for each style, because we have different things we need to remember, right? Like, okay, I am in this moment, you know, and, and all kinds of other really cool bonuses, but those are the ones that are particular to each style because I love meditations. So I always like to create some to go along with my work. That's good. What were you going to ask? Um, I don't know what I was going to (laughs) ask, but (laughs) I, oh, I know what I was going to ask. I was going to say, um, so the the simple strategy for the dynamo is just really doing that work to recognize that you are enough. Exactly. And there are definite, like in the book, I break it down to the, you know, preventative strategies that are multiple times a day, that are daily, that are weekly, and that are even once a year. And then the in the moment strategies are especially for dynamos, they're going to be more mindfulness strategies, grounding um, mantras that remind you what is most important to me again? Is it finishing my list or is it this other thing that I say is most important to me? Okay. You know, what can I do then to take some things off my list that maybe don't really have to be done today? Okay, great. I'll write them for next Tuesday. And then I still feel like I'm in control of my list, yeah. right? Because yeah. I decided um, yeah. and even deciding like, okay, I want to, you know, do this many mindfulness, you know, maybe breathing exercises this week, add that to your list. So you, you use your style in your need to accomplish, but you use it in a way that's going to serve you to be present more often, get into the moment, reconnect with your intuition, your gut, your heart 
like I remember, I mean, this is a little caveat. I had a coach early, early on when I was really in the weeds with my kids and I was feeling very overwhelmed and feeling that, that I don't want to say that balance, but that whatever the opposite of balance is that chaos between feeling really exhausted, but at the same time, um, you know, like bored, <laughs> like I, like I wasn't doing anything, but I was busy all the time. You know, I right. felt overwhelmed, but also unchallenged. And that was really yeah. frustrating as a dynamo. So I had all these weird, I didn't understand how to make it work. And the coach asked me, well, when's the last time you made a decision just purely from your heart? And I did not understand the question. I, I said, well, so do you mean like a totally irrational decision? That was my response to her. And she said, ouch. And I, and I said, okay, okay, let me think. Let me think a decision from my heart. I get what you're saying. And the only things I could think of were my decision to have my third child and my decision to have my fourth child, because those were not rational. That didn't make any financial sense, logical sense. You know, those were purely from my heart. And she said, were you, you know, were you pleased with your decisions? And I said, heck yeah. You know, I really, really was It'd be weird to say I wasn't in a podcast anyway, but I was. And so that was kind of the beginning of, oh, wow, I've been actively ignoring my heart and disrespect, like kind of labeling it as an irrational, like lesser choice. So that's been the journey of the last say 14 years or so. Mm hmm. Yeah, I love that. And it's interesting because when, as you were talking, I'm thinking, you know, if you stay in that place, then shame ends up piling up. We talked about shame and self-judgment earlier. And that's when that builds up is if we don't mm -hmm. do this work to be able to navigate. Right. Right. Exactly. And you're just, you're going to have so much more joy, right? When you yeah. have some, when you're able to realize, oh, this is what's happening. This is why. Where is it serving me? Great. Where is it not serving me? Okay. What do I do? What do I do in mm -hmm. these cases? So, okay, let's go to the next one. Yeah. You want to pick, pick another one out of the hat? Okay. Let's do lover. Okay. So lovers are people who are very, very driven by their relationships with the people in their life, their loved ones. And so much so that, you know, it's really all about feeling wanted, feeling, um, be a sense of belonging, feeling um, liked, wanted, appreciated by the other people in your life. So for instance, you might know you're a lover if you saw on Facebook or social media that some friends of yours or some colleagues of yours had gotten together just right near your house last week. They were all you know, together. They posted pictures and you never heard a word about it. And instead of what would be a very natural response of like, you know, disappointment or confusion, or, you know, that's a bummer. I would have liked to go or hurt feelings. Lovers tend to take it to a much deeper level. Oh my gosh, is Robin mad at me? Like, did I say something to offend her in that? Oh my God, she must, she must have just, she must have done that podcast with me and thought, oh my God, Amber doesn't even know what she's talking about. I can't stand her. I don't want to be around her. Like, you know, your brain spirals to this worst case scenario, this magical thinking of, of feeling your worst nightmare, which is people don't want to be around you, that your partner doesn't want to spend time with you, that they secretly would rather stay late at work than come home and have dinner with you. So a real trigger is, you know, a quick text from your partner or good friend, hey, I can't make it. Hey, I'm going to be late. Hey, I need to cancel our plans. So it's not only that, that normal, I don't want to say normal, that common disappointment it's this further kind of spiraling that can happen. Oh, shoot. You know, they're making that up because they don't want to spend time with me. They're really going and spending time with their friends and they don't want me to know. They're mad at me about something and don't want to say it. They're about to break up with me. You know, your mind can go and go and go. So one of the strategies, for instance, that I'll recommend for people who either are lovers or who have lovers close in their lives, which I would say almost everybody does, you know, instead of, you know, you, so say if I'm a lover and you're my partner, Robin, I can say, Hey, can you do me a favor? Like, this is a, it's a weird trigger for me. Like if you have to work late, like it's totally me, like this is, you take responsibility for your own emotional 
stuff, right? And you say, it would be like so much more helpful if you say like, hey, I have this presentation. I have to do it tomorrow. Like the head manager's coming in. I have like four more slides to do. I'm super stressed about it, but I know that if I can, if I have another hour or two, I can really nail it. And how about when, when I come home, we just like order Thai food and like sit and watch, you know, um, the, you know, Ted Lasso. How's that sound? Perfect. So it's explaining in a little bit more detail, could be two more sentences, why, and making plans for connection later. That, that two components will make your life as a partner of a lover so much more easy because then you're coming home to this excited person who just ordered Thai food and you got, you know, Ted Lasso already on the computer or on the TV instead of somebody like secretly thinking you just avoided them purposely and maybe you lied to them and maybe you were out having some beers with coworkers and you don't like me and maybe, you know, and that's yeah, a super that's, different energy to come home to. <laughs> right. Yeah. A vicious spiral too. You know, I can see how that could happen. Okay. Exactly. I love that. And I, I love the um, proactive tips that you're giving because, mm -hmm. and I talk about this um, a lot when I do in my speaking engagements and stuff too, where you can plan ahead. As long as you create a strategy, you can avoid the negative reactions and even better, you are then able to do things that you didn't think you'd be able to do because anxiety was holding you back. Right. Yeah. And if you're able to explain to somebody, I think, you know, when, when my husband and I first moved in with each other, I had been in a relationship before where money was a big trigger arguments about money was very emotional topic for me. I couldn't even have a conversation about money with somebody without like tearing up. Like it was just this visceral reaction. So we were sharing rent at the time and and he said, okay, well, just like, let me know when it's due and I'll, you know, write a check. And I said, so I have to let you know that if you forget, I might have a hard time reminding you. And if I remind you, I might be like literally crying when I do it and just know it's not about you. Like, this is just something that's really still hard for me to talk about. I have a lot of like, just a lot of emotion around, around money. And he said, well, do you want me to just like pre-write the checks and then I could just put them here in this top drawer and you can just take them when you need them? And that exchange alone, he didn't even have to do that. But when I came to the table and was able to express without any judgment for, you know, about him, purely taking responsibility for my own baggage, I wasn't healed, clearly. I wasn't like, no, none of us is like, oh, I'm perfectly healed already. I was coming at it, but with a vulnerability he was able to then respond kind of with an over the top suggestion, which then just reduced my anxiety about dealing with money with him at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it was amazing. So it was like diffused, like you said, ahead of time. And so if we have this insight combined with self-kindness about that insight about ourselves, man, are we able to reduce future conflicts, you know, so much more easily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next let's do the fighter. Okay. I, I do have to say that lovers like tend to be more in their hearts, obviously, and in the present moment or in the past than in the future. Right. So that's another kind of differing fa differentiating factor. They will, they will tend to make decisions based on feelings instead of like, you know, a logical sequence of, you know, pluses and minuses and things like that. So, okay. Which one do you want to do next? Let's do fighter. Fighter. Okay, great. So fighters tend to be the people in your life who, when there is a conflict, when there is an injustice that's happening outside, it might have nothing to do with them. They will move toward it. They will get involved. They have this propensity, this urge to help the underdog to come in and they see some bullying. They see something that's unfair and it could be in the house, could be in the school, could be in their community, could be in the political arena they, they go, they move toward it, right? They're very comfortable in conflict. They are very accustomed to chaos, right? To a challenge, right? So they will often see themselves as survivors, right? As, um, and they wear it as a badge of honor. Like I have survived a lot, right? So this is a sense of pride. 
um, as it should be. I'm not saying it shouldn't be. Um, the downside of this, right? Because that's beautiful, right? You want to save people. You want to protect people. Often it comes from having had a lot of trauma or conflict in your childhood where you didn't feel safe, where there weren't caring adults that came in to protect you. So when you see that happening on the world stage or in your environment or across the street, you will go help that underdog. You will become that person that you never had yourself, uh -huh. right? So um, unfortunately for a lot of fighters, then they have a lot of conflict in their life. They have a lot of ups and downs. They have a very tumultuous string of relationships or tumultuous relationships with money where all of a sudden, you know, they one day they have a lot of money. The next day they're really struggling. It goes up and down and up and down. Maybe health issues, right? Maybe it's weight gain. Maybe it's eating issues. So they are very comfortable in the chaos. So what's, what's interesting about fighters is their triggers tend to be almost the opposite of other people's triggers. When everything's calm, everything's going really smoothly. I'm really happy in my relationship. That could be very, very uncomfortable, very unsettling because, man, if I let my guard down, I'm not going to be ready for when the shit hits the fan. I'm not going to be ready for, because something's going to happen because it always does. That's my experience. And I can't let my guard down and just be happy and chill. So my life lesson as a fighter then is how do I start to learn to feel safe? in the happy, to feel safe in the calm? And how can I more purposefully still feel that adrenaline surge of challenge in my life, right? So maybe I become a, a what are those races that are like way crazier than marathons where it's like you go, you the do ultra like a marathon, like like you run ultra, 72 hours, right? yeah. <laughs> like all those crazy <laughs> you know, physical miles, things, yeah. right? Or maybe I choose a job that's really, you know, high stress and a lot of conflict. And, you know, maybe I'm a litigator, right? Or maybe I'm, you know, I'm um, an activist of some sort, right? So how can I consciously choose where I want to have conflict in my life? And then where am I exhausted from the conflict? Like I am done with dating these terrible people that are un that I have these unhealthy relationships with. I just want to feel loved and safe and happy with somebody. Okay, now how do you get comfortable with that? How do you choose differently when you've been, had this pattern in your past? So you know the fighter's life lesson is how do I enjoy my life when it's good? <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> it sounds so simple, you know? And so, you know, I would say like, you, you might know you're a fighter if the, if you've had several people in your life say things like, why are you even getting involved in that it has nothing to do with you? You know, I don't understand why you keep getting involved with things that have nothing to do with us or our family. Don't you have enough other problems to worry about? Uh -huh. And the truth is yes, but also there's this strong drive and it's beautiful and it, you've developed some amazing qualities, right? Of persistence and strength and fortitude. And also that's exhausting. It's, it, it's exhausting and you deserve to, to feel happy and safe. And what, what are the steps you can do to start moving there? So a lot of the strategies around fighters are things like those deep inner child meditations, those in like kind of reparenting, kind of becoming the parent that you didn't have, right? So how can you heal some of those early wounds um, and become more conscious of, you know, before you jump in, you know, you see something on Facebook, before you jump into it, ask yourself, choose, is this something like, what's my level of, of conflict right now in my life? Is it already a little bit more than I have the bandwidth for? okay, I can choose. I can choose not to add that to my plate. Mm -hmm. And that can become something that's empowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, this is fascinating. I have like, oh, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. <laughs> and we all, right. all have pieces of this. Like they're definitely both <laughs> people who are like, oh, when I was in my 20s, that was totally me. And yeah. now I've shifted. Now I'm more on this side a little bit. Yeah, because we we learn and we grow. Now, I will say though, some people, learn and grow, not yeah. everyone, 
right? Yeah, because some people just haven't discovered the tools that they need. Like this could be absolutely life-changing for so many people yeah. and at various ages or stages of their lives. Okay, let's do executive and then okay. we'll do visionary. So executives are people who are amazing and tend to do a lot of planning, organizing. So their goal is to feel emotionally safe. And the mechanism they utilize for that is control and structure, <laughs> right? So it's, a, I want to know what's coming so that I can prepare for it. And then I'm going to prepare for it. So people will often come to you to prepare for things. You might be somebody, when I was interviewing people for this book, um, the one of my editors said, oh yes, I'm totally executive. And it wasn't until I was in a relationship with somebody that I that I realized this was weird, but I always carry a first aid kit with me. That's what she told me. And it's for in case somebody else around me needs it. I, I always have to have a first aid, aid kit around me. And she was not a mother and she just was, you know, a single person in her 20s and didn't realize that that wasn't something everybody did because it seems so obvious. Why wouldn't you carry a first aid, aid kit with you? I mean, I'm lucky if I have a Band-Aid somewhere in my person or in my car, right? Yeah. So, um, so with executives, it's all about that sense of safety. And in this day and age, it's not, it's not always just physical safety, right? It's, it's also emotional safety. Yeah. So I feel more emotionally safe when I have these, when I have this sense of control and knowing, okay. So for instance, if a, um, executive is in a relationship with a lover and the lover comes home and says, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe this. My boss just gave us his beach house for the weekend. Like, let's go, let's pack. This is amazing. Like you should see this beach house. It's so cool. It could be the best news ever. The executive is going to need a minute. <laughs> They're not going to say, oh, that's lovely. Oh, the, the lover's so happy. Oh my gosh. I get all my favorite people to myself in this beautiful setting for the whole weekend. The executive is saying, uh, okay, so we already made plans. We were supposed to go to this birthday party tomorrow afternoon. I was going to spend tomorrow morning working on taxes. Remember, you told me you take the kids to the park and you know, you're know, you thinking, panic, how am I going to rearrange all of the things I had planned out? And it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It means if, if the lover knows they're coming home to an executive, they might say, hey, I have a really good news, but it might mean some big changes for the weekend. So like, we can talk through that and, but I think it might be worth it to make those changes. So like, here's like, let's talk through it. And, and on the other side, the executive can say, Hey, I can see you're really excited about this. And I really want to spend time with you this weekend. Also, that's important to me. However, I spent a lot of time arranging a bunch of things for the family this weekend as well. So I'm going to need a minute a, to see if I am even like capable of doing this. And if I am, I'm I'm going to need some time before I get as excited about it as you are. Like, so it's not personal. So that's where really understanding yourself, your own triggers, you can, can communicate that. And then hopefully, you know, you maybe you decide to just go for half the weekend. You don't go right now. We go tomorrow morning. Okay. All right. I can handle that. <laughs> I yeah. can prepare and you take care of dinner and I'm going to go email people and call them and rearrange the schedule. Great. So executives are people who are in their heads, you know, like the dynamos, they're in the future, right? Like the visionaries and the dynamos. And um, they are, you know, really compelled and driven by the need to feel safe and to make sure that the other people they care about in their world could be their business, it could be their friends, it could be their neighbors, it could be a cause that's really important to them, that that is safe and protected and cared for. That's the first, that's just the top priority for executives. Mm, this is so great. So, 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 so good. Okay, let's do visionary because that's the last okay. one and then we'll wrap up. Okay, cool. So visionaries are like in the title, um, you know, focused on a grand, vision, a grand dream, a future, this deep sense of purpose for something big. Now, visionaries who've figured out what that is, who have clarity, can feel you know very energized, very focused, have a hard time kind of slowing down and connecting with the people who maybe 
don't have grand plans, you know, the people who really are all about like, Hey, I want to connect with you right here in this moment. And they're like, but don't you understand? I have these grand plans. Like that's so much more important, um, to them in that moment. Um, are they maybe missing out on some wonderful things in the moment that they might also enjoy? Yes, maybe. And there are strategies for how you can do that. Um, and so visionaries tend to be, you know, th this is how they're different from dynamos. Like they might not be super attentive to all the little details that take that need to take place to get to that grand plan, right? Um, they might ebb and flow all kind of all over the place. They might make decisions more from their heart and their gut than like super regimented planning out strategy, right? But they are future oriented and achievement oriented like dynamos. So in some ways they're very similar, but their process might be very different. So visionaries, you know, I always imagine that, you know, you're kind of in the hospital and you're late end of your life and you're, you've got your Forbes magazine cover next to you of, you know, your big, big accomplishment that you succeeded in. And, you know, the question is, are you alone in the room? Or are you surrounded by friends and family who were connected and with you and supported you and, you know, your cheerleaders the entire way? And I'm guessing that for most people, having a room full of people would be the best of both worlds, like having that Forbes cover and that accomplishment and having that support and emotional connection with the people you care about along the way. So a lot of the strategies around visionaries support, how do you maintain those relationships and help the other people in your life feel supported? Like you care about what's important to them because it might not be the same thing that's important to you. And having that mutual respect and um, being in the moment with those people can really help to enlarge and amplify that big dream win that you have at the end. Mm, I love that. Yeah, because I mean, really, what is success if you're alone? Yeah, but often the visionary is is so single minded. Yeah, that it's it's just it's not an automatic thing that makes sense yeah. to them in that daily moment. They would agree with you, likely, in theory, right? <laughs> Philosophically, yeah. yes, of course. But when it comes to okay, out of the last seven days, how many of those days did you spend one on one with somebody where you didn't have your phone, where you weren't in another place mentally, you know, where you were really in the moment, you know, is it, is it also really happening? And, you know, visionaries who haven't figured out what that dream is for them can feel very frustrated and flustered, you know, because they know it's there, it's driven, they feel this deep, meaningful, I am meant for more than this, and I know it but I don't know what that is yet. That can be extremely excruciatingly frustrating for visionaries. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this has been fabulous. This is such a great perspective. So one last question for you, are these yours or are these, are these They're five? Mine. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. This is a, yeah. It's a novel framework. Um, it was, it initially came as, as a, a download, a, you know, I call it a download is it yeah. uh, after a meditation is, it all kind of started clicking together with, you know, thinking about the five love languages and how that has helped serve people kind of understand, oh, this is how you receive love, but I receive love differently. And okay, wow, that provides some insight. And it was March of 2020. And it was when the world was just, there was a lot of fear in the world and a lot yeah. of uncertainty. And what I saw as a result was a, a lot of um, difficulty having compassion for others and having compassion for yourself amidst mm -hmm. just so much fear. And anxiety. And so this came from a, a deep urge to, wow, how can we help people have some more insight and self-awareness so that we can be more compassionate with ourselves and then we can be more compassionate with others. Yeah. And then yeah. hopefully that cascades from there. Mm, this is so good. Thank you so much, Amber, for being here. Listeners. Thank you. I want to thank you for staying. This is a super long episode. So if you stayed till the end, you get a bonus today. Pat yourself <laughs> on the back. But I really believe this is such valuable information. I think it can truly transform lives and, and 
relationships. And at the root of all of us is that need for relationships, that sense of community. So I think this is so critical to really dive into it, but give yourself that grace to try one thing at a time. And if you connected with this, I would love to hear what your thoughts are. I'm sure Amber would too. Give her some love over on Instagram. I know she's really active there, but also share it with those people in your life who may be struggling and don't even know why they're struggling, or maybe they're in this path of, or this pattern of negative relationships and they're can't figure out why maybe maybe this is the answer and then i'm going to have amber tell us a little bit more about the book when it's going to be released and where you can purchase it so that you can absolutely get it and dive even deeper into what we've talked about today so amber thank you so much for being here will you please tell the listeners how they can connect with you learn more from you and get your book definitely yes so i'm at ambertrueblood.com the book is called the unflustered mom but as you saw from the examples you don't have to be a mom to resonate with this or benefit from the strategies. I think there's only one chapter that's like specifically about anxieties that are related to that transition to motherhood. Um, but other than that, I think everybody can relate to this book and the strategies within it and hopefully benefit from it. And I have a host of really cool bonus materials that I think can be incredibly powerful as accompaniments to this kind of mindset shift. So if you go to my website, you can see there where you can like say, oh, I want the strategies for the dynamos. And then you click that and you go ahead, put, you know, put in your email address and you'll get those. But if you also want the strategies for lovers, then you can just do it again for lovers. And um, so definitely do that. And the Unflustered Mom is available on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble, on bookshop.org. If you prefer ordering through independent bookstores, it will also hopefully be at your local bookstore. Um, I love, I'm obsessed with books. So um, always, always please ask for the books as that's how authors, that's how bookstores know you even want them. And there's something like 500,000 traditionally published books every single year. So they have to be very choosy about um, so unless you're a very well-known, you know, athlete or influencer or something like that, they won't automatically put your books in. So, yeah. um, so please, you know, pre-order the book if it's before June 6th. Um, and that will also indicate to booksellers, oh shoot, this book is like, there's about 1200 pre-orders already, which I'm super excited about. So, um, it seems to be, I think hitting a nerve with people, which makes me so happy um, because that means it might actually help people. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's going to help people. This is even just this conversation today, which is just a tiny nugget of the, yeah. of the book is amazing. So thank you so much for taking the time and energy to write the book amidst your crazy life with four boys. And um, I look forward to staying in touch and listeners, please. Leave us a rating and review if you enjoyed the episode, found it helpful so that we can continue to get amazing guests like Amber on the show. Have a great week. Thank you week so much. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody have a great week and I'll see you next time.